Hello, welcome. Uh, I'm going to tell you a very short, short story by Hermann Hesse, the German philosopher of last century. It's in line with 1984 and Brave New World. And this is about the First World War. Before the war, this guy just went off, wanted to avoid the war, so went off to some other galaxy in the universe came back after the war and of course everything is destroyed his house however is still there not in very good condition and this is what happens I found my house partly destroyed by aerial bombs but still more or less fit to sleep in however it was cold and uncomfortable the rubble on the floor and the mold on the walls were distressing and i soon went out for a walk a great change had come over the city there were no shops to be seen and the streets were lifeless before long a man with a tin number pinned to his hat came up to me and asked me what i was doing i said i was taking a walk he said have you got a permit? I didn't understand. An altercation ensued and he ordered me to follow him to the nearest police station. We came to a street where all the buildings had white signs bearing the names of offices followed by numbers and letters. One sign read Unoccupied civilians 2487B4. We went in. The usual official premises, waiting rooms and corridors smelling of paper, damp clothing and bureaucracy. After various inquiries, I was taken to room 72 and questioned. An official looked me over. Can't you stand at attention? He asked me in a stern voice. No, I said. Why not? He asked. Because I never learned how, I said timidly. In any case, he said, you were taking a walk without a permit. Do you admit that? Yes, I said. That seems to be true. I didn't know. You see, I'd been ill for quite some time and... He silenced me with a gesture. The penalty? You are forbidden to wear shoes for three days. Take off your shoes. I took off my shoes. Good God, man, the official was struck with horror. Leather shoes? Where did you get them? Are you completely out of your mind? I may not be quite normal mentally, I myself can't judge. I bought the shoes a few years ago. Don't you know that the wearing of leather shoes in any shape or form by civilians is prohibited? Your shoes are confiscated. And now let's see your identification papers. Merciful heavens, I had none. Incredible! the official moaned. Haven't seen anything like it in over a year. He called the policeman. Take this man to office 19, room 8. I was driven barefoot through several streets. We went into another official building, passed through corridors, breathed the smell of paper and hopelessness. Then... I was pushed into a room and questioned by another official. This one was in uniform. You were picked up on the street without identification papers. You are fined $2,000. I will make out your receipt immediately. I, I beg your pardon, I, I, faltered. I faltered. I haven't that much money on me. Could you, couldn't you just lock me up for a little while instead he laughed out loud lock you up my dear fellow what an idea do you expect us to feed you in the bargain no my friend if you can't pay the trifling fine i shall have to impose our heaviest penalty temporary withdrawal of your existence permit 
kindly hand me your existence card. I had none. The official was speechless. He called in two associates. They conferred in whispers, repeatedly motioning in my direction and looking at me with horror and amazement. Then my official had led me uh, away to a detention room pending deliberations on my case. There several persons were sitting or standing about. A soldier stood guard at the door. I noticed that apart from my lack of shoes, I was by far the best dressed of the lot. The others treated me with a certain respect and made uh, a, seat, a seat free for me. A timid little man settled up to me, bent down and whispered in my ear, I've got a magnificent bargain for you. I have a sugar beet at home, a whole sugar beet in perfect condition. It weighs, weighs almost seven pounds. Yours for the asking. What do you offer? He moved his ear close to my mouth and I whispered, You make me an offer. How much do you want? He whispered softly back, let's say $150. I shook my head and looked away. Soon I was deep in thought. I saw that I had been absent for too long. It would be hard for me to adapt. I'd have been given a good deal <clears throat> for a pair of shoes or stockings, my my bare feet were miserably cold from the wet street, but everyone else in the room was barefoot too. After a few hours, they came for me. I was taken to office 285, room 19F. This time, the policeman stayed with me. He stationed himself between me and the official, a very high official, it seemed to me. You've put yourself in a very nasty position, he began. You have been living in this city without an existence permit. You are aware, no doubt, that the heaviest penalties are in order. I made a slight bow. If you please, I said, I have only one request. I realize that I am quite unequal to the situation and that my position can only get worse and worse. Could you condemn me to death? I should be very grateful. The official looked gently into my eyes. I understand, he said amiably, but anybody could uh, come asking for that. In any case, you'd need a demise card. Can you afford one? They cost $4,000. No, I haven't got that much money, but I'd give all I have. I have an enormous desire to die. He smiled strangely. I can believe that you're not the only one. But dying isn't so simple. You belong to the state, my dear man. You are obligated to the state body and soul. You must know that. But by the way, I see you've registered under the name of Sinclair, Emil. Could you be Sinclair the writer? That's me. Oh, I'm so glad. Maybe I can do something for you. Officer, you may leave. The policeman left the room. The official shook my hand. I've read your books with great interest, he said in a friendly tone, and I'll do my best to help you. But, good God, how did you get into this incredible situation? Well, you see, I was away for a while. Two or three years ago, I took refuge in the cosmic, and frankly, I had rather supposed that the, do that the war would be over by the time I got back. But tell me, can you get me a demise card? I'd be ever so grateful. 
It may be possible, but first you'll need an existence permit. Obviously, nothing can be done without that. I'll give you a note to Office 127. On my recommendation, they will issue you a temporary existence card, but it will only be valid for two days. Oh, that will be more than enough. Very well, when you have it, come back here to me. We shook hands. One more thing, I said softly. May I ask you a question? You must realize how little I know about what's been going on. Go right ahead. Well, here is what I'd like to know. How can life go on under th these conditions? How can people stand it? Oh, they're not so badly off. Your situation is exceptional. A civilian and without papers. There are very few civilians left. Practically everyone who isn't a soldier is a civil servant and works for the government. That makes life bearable for most people. A good many are genuinely happy. Little by little, one gets used to the shortages. When the potatoes gave out, we had to put up with sawdust gruel. They seasoned it with tar now. It's surprisingly tasty. We all thought it would be unbearable, but then we got used to it. And the same with everything else. I see, I said. It's really not so surprising. But there is one thing I still don't understand. Tell me, why is the whole world making these enormous efforts, putting up with such hardships, with all these laws, these thousands of bureaus and bureaucrats? What is all this meant to preserve? What is all this meant to preserve and safeguard? The gentleman looked at me in amazement. What a question! He cried, shaking his head. You know we're at war. The whole world is at war. That's what we are preserving. What we make laws and endure hardships for. The war. Without these enormous exertions and achievements, our armies wouldn't be able to fight for a week. They'd starve. We can't allow that. Yes, I said slowly, you've got something there. The war, in other words, is a treasure that must be preserved at any cost. Yes, but I know it's an odd question. Why do you value the war so highly? Is it worth so much? Is war really a treasure? The official shrugged his shoulders and gave me a pitying look. He saw that I just didn't understand. My dear Sinclair, he said, you've lost contact with the world. Go out into the street, talk to people, then make a slight mental effort and ask yourself, what have we got left? What is the substance of our lives? Only one answer is possible. The war is all we have left. Pleasure and personal profit, social ambition, greed, love, cultural activity, all that has gone out of existence. If there is still any law, order or thought in the world, we have the war to thank for it. Now, do you understand? Yes, now I understood and I thanked the gentleman kindly. I left him and mechanically pocketed the recommendation to Office 127. I had no intention of using it. I had no desire to molest the gentleman in those offices any further. Before anyone could notice me and stop me, I inwardly recited the short astral spell, turned off my heartbeat and made my body vanish under a clump, clump of bushes. I pursued my cosmic 
wanderings and abandoned the idea of going home. Herman Hesse. Thank you for listening. See you later. Bye-bye.